Welcome everybody to the SNN Network Australia virtual event. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and I'd like to introduce our next panel here at our event. This is Learn About the ASX Technology and U.S. Operations. Uh, we did a similar panel back at an event that we did in August, which was ASX listed companies with operations in the U.S. And that was kind of really the inspiration for doing our full event with a complete Australia focus. So we wanted to bring back an element of that panel as well as focus on a sector in Australia that uh, sometimes gets a little overlooked and that's technology. So helping us out to moderate this panel, coming back to moderate this panel is Mark Tobin from Coffee Microcaps. So with that, Mark, take it away. Cheers, thanks, Bobby. Um... Yeah, great to be back and uh, glad to see that, uh, you know, we've got a couple of uh, return returning companies to, to join us once again. So it'd be good to get an update on, uh, you know, where things have have progressed from when we when we did the event back in August. Um, I'm quickly just going to kick off with uh, a kind of a standard question for all three of the, the companies, if we can maybe just give an overview of the business for anybody who mightn't have seen the, the August one or be familiar with you guys, and maybe just put a little bit on the end of, you know, where your kind of US operations uh, sit as part, a part, of the, part of the business. So I'm gonna start, let, let's start uh, probably the easiest one. Let's start with um, Stephen from, from Visioneering. Hey, thanks, Mark. Yeah, quick uh, introduction to Visioneering. We are in Atlanta, Georgia. Operationally, though, we sell product uh, around the world in Europe, the United States, Australia, Canada, a couple of parts of Asia. And what we are is we are a contact lens company. Uh, if you just look at our contact lenses, these are floppy little lenses that uh, you're probably familiar with. You put in your eye, you see better. But uh, we have some pretty special optics in ours. There are two patient populations that these contact lenses uh, are used by. The first one are children. These are children who are nearsighted. Uh, and that describes about a quarter to a third of children in the United States, 80 to 90% of children in Asia. Uh, China and Singapore have actually declared nearsightedness in children to be an epidemic. Uh, the percentages of children who are nearsighted in most industrialized nations has more than doubled in most uh, countries over the last 30 years. So it is a massive problem. The worse the nearsightedness gets in a child, the more likely they are to uh, suffer some pretty bad stuff in their vision, blindness, retinal detachment, glaucoma, cataracts, and they, they carry that risk throughout uh, their entire lives. So very important in large po patient population. Uh, the other patient group that uses our contact lenses are adults over the age of 45 who are losing the ability to see up close. And unfortunately, that is pretty much everyone over the age of 45. Uh, we're a fairly new company. We IPO'd in Australia in 2017. And 2017 is when we really uh, started growing the company and adding sales and uh, marketing musculature to the company and going out and getting these clearances around uh, the world. So we're new, but uh, we're growing very fast and hope to be able to talk a little bit more about that. Right, thanks, Stephen. Uh, and then we'll go to our debutante next for for, for this panel. Uh, Brad, uh, I know Cogstate's been around on the ASX for, for quite a long time. Uh, it's been on a, a I think the, a, a journey it must be going on probably about 10 years now. So if you can just give us a, a sense of where the company has come from over that point to, to kind of where you are today. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, we're actually um, uh, coming up on 16 years we've been listed on the ASX. So um, the company was founded in uh, at the end of the 90s um, and so it's been around for 20 years now. Uh, we uh, were formed in Australia, so our uh, head office in Australia. Um, we actually employ more people in the United States than we do in Australia. So about 160 full-time employees um, and the majority of those in the United States. Um, Cogstate was formed uh, with the original investment thesis that uh, we have an aging population, uh, an increasing incidence of Alzheimer's disease, and that doctors would need better technology and better tools to be able to identify the first signs of memory impairment and cognitive impairment associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, that was 20 years ago, and when the company was first formed, we thought that the world was getting quite close to the 
launch of the first Alzheimer's disease therapeutic. Some 20 years on, um, we're perhaps just about to uh, get to that point. So we, but we commercialize our technology in two areas. Uh, the first is in clinical drug trials, where our technology and the associated services are used by pharma companies uh, as an endpoint in their clinical trials. So in things like Alzheimer's disease studies, where you're looking for an efficacy uh, endpoint, so to see whether the drug is making people think better, um, or as in, um, in studies such as in oncology studies, where you might be worried that the drug is causing uh, an impairment in terms of someone's ability to think. And so we're used as a safety endpoint in that setting. Um, the other part of our business and the bit that's um, you know, pretty exciting at the moment is the use of our technology in primary care medicine or general practice medicine. Um, and we've uh, just signed in the last couple of weeks an agreement with uh, pharmaceutical company ASI, um, who will be commercialising our uh, technology in that market globally. Uh, so that's really exciting for us. Our other returning company, uh, Bruce, uh, do you want to give us a, a quick overview of the quick fee business again? Yeah, no, no problem, Mark. It's good to be here again. Um, yeah, so, uh, so quick fees in the fintech space rather than sort of the, the, the buyer sort of space or, or the medical sort of space, we, um, we provide a payment gateway along with payment plans for people to pay for professional services. So uh, a typical small, medium business might go and see their, uh, their accountant or their lawyer or some other professional services provider. Uh, we will make it easy for that person to be paid, whether it's paid in full, ele electronically and online, or by using a quick fee payment plan. And what's changed since, uh, since we were here in, in August, Mark, is we've now brought out a full uh, equivalent to the buy now, pay later space. We call it advice now, pay later, where literally firms can offer their clients for interest-free instalments as a further way than to pay, and especially during this pandemic time, when uh, when small business and medium-sized businesses really need advice from an accountant, a lawyer, a, a recruiter, a, a financial planner, whatever, they can now pay in four easy interest-free instalments. So that's uh, that's been a big development for us, and that product literally just been launched this month. Great, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, well, I think we'll get into that a bit more because I, I want to expand. On, on that partnership with the displayed guys and what it kind of means um, more broadly in terms of you know that expanded market and, and a few other things around the side of it i'm going to circle back to the top and go to Stephen again if i can uh Stephen, you know we've had the latest quarterly out from vti since august it was a, a record quarter for you despite you know disruptions from covid uh, and you know, having to kind of re-engineer the business in terms of staff and supply chains and all that. Can, can you give us a, a sense of you know what what factors contributed to you know getting that result in such kind of trying circumstances? Yeah, so I guess we'd have to step back to April. Uh, and April, as we saw the pandemic really starting to get a foothold, uh, we laid off about half the company. Uh, we laid off, uh, which was very painful, about three-fourths of our sales force uh, back in April. So we didn't have, uh, you know, huge expectations for the second, third, fourth quarter of the year. The second quarter did not disappoint. Uh, it was horrible. We were down 40, over 40% 40 uh, revenue on a quarter-over-quarter -quarter basis. Uh, all optometrists were closed for a good part of the second quarter. And in the third quarter, uh, it's just an extraordinary turnaround. Uh, so like you said, in the third quarter, we set records. Uh, almost all of our KPIs, uh, we broke records. Uh, our revenue was up 140% quarter over quarter. And you, you could say, well, you know, second quarter was really bad, so that's not very fair. But uh, it was up 11% over the same period uh, last year, where we had, you know, twice the company. Uh, cash receipts from customers were up 74%, uh, 2.6 million Aussies for the quarter, uh, which was extraordinary. That was a record for us. Uh, gross margin set a record at 46%. We had a record number of active accounts even. So even with our sales force having been reduced by as much as it was, we still set 
a record in uh, a, a new new account uh, creation. For the first time in that quarter, we cash flowed positive, excluding uh, what we spent on inventory purchases. So even set a record there as well. And and yeah, so it's a good question. What you know during a pandemic, how how do you thrive like this? And I think it starts with having a very large uh, addressable market. So like I said before, you got a quarter of kids and the United States are nearsighted. You have uh, 80 to 90% of children and many of the Asian uh, nations who are nearsighted. It is a massive uh, problem. And you know, a year and a half ago, we, we started to see this swell in interest and knowledge around nearsightedness in children among practitioners and parents and the importance of addressing nearsightedness and managing it as early as possible in a child's life. And the pandemic, oddly, has actually helped that. Uh, a couple of the really big factors of the development of nearsightedness in children is screen time and not enough time outside. Both of those have been exacerbated as risk factors. As we've gotten into the pandemic, kids are home from school, much more time in front of the screens uh, than they even had before, uh, much more time indoors because uh, they don't have that exposure to a school setting where they spend at least some time outside. So uh, we think that one of the really big factors here, in addition to there having been a swelling of interest and uh, knowledge around myopia over the past couple of years that we've been out in front of, has been the pandemic itself. Uh, we probably also got a little bit of residual demand from the second quarter when uh, parents were and, and other patients were not seeing their practitioners. Uh, and so we think some of that bled into the third quarter probably didn't hurt that uh, third quarter is seasonally the best quarter of the year for contact lenses in general. Uh, you know, fourth quarter is generally the weakest. Uh, so we, you know, we probably had that strength behind us as well. But you know, just uh, bottom line is we have a large addressable market. Uh, it has survived the pandemic very, very well. People are still going uh, to their practitioners and their optometrists, and it may have actually been helped by the pandemic, at least on the, on the myopia side. Thanks, Stephen. That was great. Um, I'm going to switch now to Brad. Brad, I know you mentioned in your introductory comments uh, about the partnership with the Japanese uh, firm ASI that you've, you know, kind of come to fruition over over the last year or so can you just maybe delve into that partnership and, and why it's kind of such a game changer um in terms of the, the cogstate business and cogstate's technology yeah yeah um so we we actually started working with azi um almost two years ago now um so they um they came to us um wanting to explore the opportunity to use our technology in the community, um, so outside of clinical trials, we ran a number of different um, pilot studies um, in Japan. Um, so different uh, with different age groups, um, both with employees of ASI using our technology, but also and sometimes their parents, um, but then also in the community. Um, that led us to the execution of an agreement in August of 2019 uh, to launch our technology. Um, uh, with them in Japan only. Um, so that uh, we launched that product um, that's known in Japan as NoNo. Uh, NoNo literally translates to know your brain. Um, uh, we launched that product in March of 2020. And so that's live now. And so what that enables people in Japan to do is to log onto that website. Um, they can take a cognitive test. They can determine if they're suffering from some kind of memory impairment. Um, and it provides advice in terms of um, you know, things like, you know, we recommend that you see your doctor, you know, or, or that there's nothing to worry about here. So it's relative, relatively limited. Um, and then the follow on from that is, of course, what we provide is um, additional tools to physicians um, to enable them uh, to assess the cognition of patients and, and make then informed decision. And obviously the reporting we provide to physicians is much more detailed than what we provide to individuals um, and, and allows the physician to make decisions um, in respect to the treatment of that patient. Um, so that was August of 2019. We executed that Japan agreement launched in March of 2020. What has then happened since over that period of time is that ASI and their development partner, um, Biogen, um, have lodged their biologic license application in respect of 
what could be the first ever disease modifying treatment for Alzheimer's disease with the FDA. Um, so that was lodged a couple of months ago. It's been given a, a PDUFA date of 7th of March of 2021. So the FDA needs to make a decision um, you know, in respect of the approval or not of that potential therapy um, by March of next year. As um, those companies are getting ready for launch of that, um, we've been able to agree with ASI to extend um, our partnership and um, enter into a global license um, whereby they will market our technology um, around the world. And so that's, that's a really big deal for us. Um, so the, the, the basic terms of the agreement um, are that it includes a um, $15 million US uh, upfront royalty payment. There's a, an additional uh, minimum $30 million of uh, minimum royalties uh, that will be paid over the next 10 years. Uh, so $45 million in guaranteed minimums. Um, the royalty that we'll, Cog State will receive will be the greater of uh, a royalty on gross sales or that minimum that's been set. So that's just the minimum level. Um, additionally, ASI will fund all commercialization and marketing activities um, and they'll fund any development that's required in respect of our product um, to adapt that for launch in different markets around the world. They've committed to launching inside in, within the US within the first 12 months, uh, within Europe uh, within the first three years and within China within the first four years of that agreement. Um, and then additionally, they've announced um, only last week that they have established a joint venture in China to establish uh, um, a, a dementia friendly um, uh, sort of an ecosystem for, you know, for dementia patients in China, where they're looking to provide a number of services to people in China who are suffering from dementia. Um, so it's a really important partnership for us and really changes our business altogether. Um, and it sets us up now um, with the opportunity to really, um, to capture the market for, you know, it, it, and, and, in terms of cognitive assessment. So when someone goes into their doctor and says, I'm worried about my memory, what does your doctor do at that point? Um, and, and, and realistically, there's, um, there's, not, um, there, there's not options that are viable for a doctor at the moment in the context of a, you know, a standard consultation timeline. Um, that doctors aren't properly trained in terms of assessment of cognition and the, and the, and the practicalities, they just don't have time to do that. Um, and so what our technology does is allow um, for that assessment to be done by either practice staff, like a practice nurse, or even in fact to be done unsupervised at home with the, with the, uh, with the data flowing directly to the prescribing physician uh, and allowing the physician to focus their time around um, management of the patient. Um, so we're really excited about that. And for us, um, you know, this generates all kinds of opportunities for us into the future. Great, thanks Brad. And then uh, from one partnership to another, uh, I'll come back to Bruce. Bruce, on the on the Split Hit partnership, I just want to mention Split Hit is actually listed on the ASX itself, your, your, your new partner. Um, can you give us a sense of, you know, what the deal with Split Hit means in terms of, you know, when we're back in August, you know, you were focused on two very key verticals. And I know in your opening remarks there, you've already mentioned a number of other verticals that, you know, probably weren't on the quick fee agenda back back in August. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the it, it, it's gone live now. I think the last announcement I saw you were kind of targeting a, mig, a, a mid October um, launch. So it's good to know that it's finally launched. But just give us a sense of uh, the deal economics, you know. Uh, you know, money raised to, to kind of fund the, the growth that you think is going to come from 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 this partnership and and the market size that's now available. Yeah, um, thanks, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we partnered with a company called Split It. Their code on the ASX is SPT. Uh, Split It have some pretty cool technology. Uh, for, for anybody who's familiar with, uh, you, you check in at a hotel, uh, usually the staff on the front desk will say to you, can we pre-authorize a few hundred dollars onto your card? 
against incidentals like mini bar room service, whatever it might be. Um, the split it technology takes that pre-authorization concept a lot further. So what it means is that QuickFee can offer a payment plan to any person that has an available limit on their credit card. And we can actually pre-authorize the full remaining balance of that payment plan to secure our credit position. So we stay as a very low risk credit provider like we always have. But it means that we can do this in a way where the size and service line of the professional services firm providing the service of that client is no longer important to QuickFee. As you're saying, uh, Mark, previously, we basically served accountants and lawyers, and they, they have been fantastic in the entire backbone of our business for, for 12 years. And um, you know, thank you to all the accountants and, and lawyers out there that have used us. What the, uh, the license that we have from Split It, which we hold exclusively for professional services, enables us to do is expand not just broadly into, say, recruiters, and we've already got some signed up, to marketing uh, sort of agencies, like for businesses which are moving online and looking to, to deal with the pandemic by opening their, their virtual store away from a bricks and mortar store uh, in, um, in, in getting at a design agency to help them with a, with a website, with e-commerce, with SEO, SEM, all that. Those sort of design agencies now, uh, we've already got some of them signed up for this solution, um, as well as accountants and lawyers, uh, surveyors, architects, all those services that we've done before. But also, it allows us to go down to consumer law. Previously, we were focused on B2B. We can now help law firms that have got clients that have got, say, an estate planning issue that they need to resolve. They need wills, they need estates. Um, it might be somebody that just wants to get some plans done to uh, to improve their home that they've been stuck in during the during the pandemic or whatever. They're, they're going to engage an architect to uh, to get some plans done or whatever. All those sort of what we would have called consumer services that we didn't do in the past are now wide open. Even um, accounting firms that we deal with are introducing their clients that are in professional services to use this product, which typically we could never do before. Um, the, the deal with Split It has totally opened up. Uh, just as an example, in accountants and lawyers, the total market that we would have typically looked at in the United States was about nine or 10,000 firms. With this new product, it is 650,000 firms in just accounting and law that are now opened up that we would not have dealt with before. Great, thanks, Bruce. Um, if we can I just go back to, to Stephen now again? Stephen, um, I mean, I used to live in Singapore for, for a while, and I mean, that's a good few years ago now. And I mean, it was obvious to somebody just even walking around, like you see all the kids like wearing glasses, you know, let's say middle schoolers, uh, early high school kids. Uh, I mean, this is not a new problem. It, it doesn't seem like a new problem to me. I mean, what have some of the bigger guys in the space been doing, you know, over the last kind of five or 10 years um, that's you know, similar to what you're doing or maybe kind of totally different to what you're doing? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I have to, to start with Brad. Um, if Brad, if, if you guys come into the United States and doing thinking tests, I'm really concerned about what you might start to find. So just to be uh, very careful of the interpretation <laughs> of those results. <laughs> uh, Mark, you, you are right. Um, so myopia or nearsightedness in children is not at all new. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, like I said, 30 years ago, it, it's half of what it, it was today is with regard to percentage of children who suffer from it. But what's really changed is a change in perspective. Uh, so only over the, the last few years has there, you call it the last 15, has there started to uh, begin a shift away from, hey, you know, nearsightedness in a kid is not merely just throwing some glasses on them so they can see better. Granted, throwing glasses on a kid does help them see better. They will see better. Uh, but 
this is a progressive disease. They get worse and worse. And what's really changed is the realization that the worse the, the vision gets, the more nearsighted they become, the higher at risk they are for very serious ocular diseases through their lifetime. And so there started an effort to figure out not only how do you correct the vision, which is really important so they can play sports, they can see the board, that sort of thing, but how do you keep them from getting worse? And the ability to do that has only been emerging over uh, really in, in a rigorous form over the last few years and uh, in the academic setting. And so, you know, a few years ago, uh, we were, we, you know, and just a couple of other companies were really talking about myopia, all small companies. So Cooper Vision was the only large company that, you know, has been talking about nearsightedness in kids for a long time and treating the progression of the nearsightedness, managing the nearsightedness uh, in these kids. The rest of the large companies were waiting for this to develop a little further, I think. But there's been a sudden uh, increase in interest among the large companies in the eye care space for uh, therapies and modalities that not only correct this vision, but aim to keep it from getting worse over time. J&J &J recently announced a product that they're putting into the research pipeline. Uh, it'll be a very expensive and long path for them with what they're contemplating, but at least they are showing that they're going to allocate a very large amount of money to this issue. Uh, Bausch has been acquiring assets in the myopia space. Cooper's been in the myopia space for a while. Alcon, when they IPO'd out of Novartis, uh, you know, said that myopia would be a big part of their growth going forward. They haven't done anything in the space yet, but uh, with everything else that's going on with the other companies, they'll have to. Uh, Menicon, one of the other multinational contact lens players has partnered with us uh, to use our contact lenses in their portfolio of myopia products. That portfolio of myopia products is really where you see these large companies going. So there's different ways of dealing with this progressive nature of nearsightedness in kids, uh, drugs, different types of, of lenses, maybe even eyeglasses uh, with some of the, the products and data that are starting to emerge in a research setting. And so the approach that's being taken and it started with Cooper and uh, Menicon is a portfolio approach. It's not just going to be contacts. It's not just going to be drugs. It's not just going to be glasses. It's going to take a portfolio of products. And so what you see them doing is really starting to gather together the assets that they need for, uh, or as a basis of a portfolio for treating nearsightedness in kids. And uh, it's a pretty exciting time. We're starting to see some consolidation in the space. Uh, and that's how you know the large companies are starting to step in. Cheers, thanks, Stephen. Um, Brad, if I can come back to you, I I, I want to. I know we've kind of talked about the the ASI partnership. Uh, I want to just expand a little bit more on what ASI and Biogene are doing together, and and kind of what that means for Cogsit. Let's theoretical scenario here. Assume that the Biogene uh, product does get a FDA approval. You know, what does that mean then, you know, for, for COG State, you know, in, in 2020, 20, or sorry, 2021 and beyond? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, there's a couple of different problems that um, if you, in, in launching a, 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 you know, an Alzheimer's disease therapy, a couple of different problems you need to solve. Um, the first is that these drugs, these, these potential therapies, are focused on what we refer to as early Alzheimer's disease. So it's, it's the idea is we're getting people early in the disease process and we're trying to stop the progression of the disease. Um, the part of the problem with that is you have to find those patients. So these, you know, the the, the earlier stages of Alzheimer's disease, and what we know now is that the, you know, the, the disease can start 20 years. Um, before you get into it, the advanced stages or the, the, the really obvious symptoms of it. So um, the question becomes, how do you find those patients? Because they're not necessarily, you know, the, you know, we're not talking about, you know, necessarily really older people who are quite sick. These can be quite well people who are, you know, living independently and looking after themselves. Um, and they may be people who just think this is just a normal part of aging. Um, so the question is, how do we identify those people? Um, so that, you know, so what it refers to as, you know, patient acquisition, 
right? So the first part of that is, you know, some awareness campaigns about making people aware that, you know, memory impairment is not a normal part of aging. It happens because there's something going on inside your brain. Um, and so having um, our tools or tools like ours uh, available to people um, and part of the attractiveness, I think, of our technology is um, that it, it is, so it's written out, out, it's a software solution written in HTML5, so it'll work on anything with a web browser. So it doesn't require any special equipment. It can be done unsupervised um, in people's homes, so they can, they can uh, assess themselves. Um, and so that's the first problem, is that sort of the idea of how do you fill the funnel? Um, if you're the drug company selling selling a drug, how do you fill the funnel, funnel in terms of finding those patients? So that's the first thing. The second aspect or the second thing you're trying to solve is, again, within the context of a standard consultation visit, um, how, do you, how does a doctor assess cognition accurately um, in that patient group, right? So, that, so that's the second aspect of our technology, the ability to provide um, a test that's been proven to be really sensitive to cognitive change that is associated with Alzheimer's disease. And we have over 600 peer reviewed um, journal articles supporting the validity of our technology in a range of different indications. So it's well validated science um, that we can provide to a doctor to, um, to be able to assess that individual and determine whether they are suffering from a level of impairment that would be consistent with um, you know, uh, prescription of the drug. There's a, I suppose, a more nuanced aspect to these particular drugs. So this, these drugs would be a monthly infusion. Um, it's expected that it would be required um, that, that the doctor demonstrate a level of um, what's referred to as amyloid plaques in the, in the brains of the patient. Um, that requires an assessment either of a, you know, under a PET scan um, or a CSF assessment. So um, a lumbar puncture to analyze CSF and determine whether there's um, these amyloid plaques in the brain. So it's, it's quite um, an invasive assessment process. So the thinking is that those patients are probably going to be referred to a specialist doctor. Right, so then the next problem to solve is the triaging of patients from primary care doctors to specialist doctors um, so that the patients most likely to go into drug can be prioritized within that specialist setting. And then the final problem that the pharma companies need to solve is that it's expected, particularly in a US market, it's expected that the payers will insist upon um, annual, they'll, they'll provide an annual uh, 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 approval for reimbursement of, of that therapy. Um, so the, there'll be an annual retesting necessary to, uh, to guarantee that the patient is still fit within that, that label of early Alzheimer's disease and that they haven't progressed into moderate Alzheimer's disease where the expectation is that payers will seek to um, you know, remove that patient from the drug because it's no longer having an effect. So there's essentially three problems we're trying to solve there. The fill the funnel, um, you know, identify the right patients and move them through the um, through the medical pathway, and then reassess them and make sure that that drug is working. Great, thanks, Brad. Um, Bruce, uh, I want to switch gears uh, quickly. Um, we've talked a lot about the, the split deal and the, I guess the the core business, but I want to switch now to the the e invoicing business. If you can give maybe just a bit of background about. Uh, what you're trying to do in in, the, in that kind of let's call it second division, uh, you know, launching and you know where that kind of fits into the the, the overall structure. Uh, absolutely, Mark. It's uh, it's uh, it's a little bit um, humbling, like listening to Brad and Steve and solving uh, significant medical issues, and uh, we're out here running a payments company, but. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge that what Stephen and doing is uh, Stephen and Brad are doing is, uh, is it's far more exciting than running an e invoicing in a payments gateway business. And all credit to what Stephen and Brad are doing, I think it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, but at the, uh, you know, at the have, end of the day, you're helping helping patients to pay for that and not putting them under financial strain. <laughs> correct. So, correct. You know, absolutely. That, that, that's one way um, to look ahead. It is. It is. Um, certainly, we're, we're certainly a mechanism by which people can access the. Uh, the care they need, there's no doubt about that. Um, 
in our um, so what we what we said about Split It and what we've done there, our, our fantastic partner Split It, is very much focused on smaller end transactions. So you know the the average ticket size might be five grand or ten grand or, or even smaller, and the service provider is more likely to be a smaller business. So you know it might be a an attorney with a few staff or a, or, or a dentist with a few staff, a medico, you know, maybe people that are using some of Stephen and Brad's treatments even could, could absolutely use that solution in their, in, their, in their medical practice as much as an accounting firm, law firm, architect, whatever it might be. As we move up to the, the enterprise grade sort of accounting and law firms, and of course, uh, I, don't, I don't know if um, people uh, listening in know this, but if, if the any of the big four accounting firms were a listed corporation, they would actually make it into the S&P top 100 on any index in the world. They are massive organisations. So, you know, if you see a PwC in every capital city around the world, but when you add them all up, these are absolutely enormous businesses, right? In hundreds of billions of dollars in, in combined revenues. Um, so when we move up scale to that sort of top 400 sort of accounting and law firms, they want enterprise grade solutions. 85% of the invoices rendered by accounting and law firms in the United States are sent by US Post. So they're lost in there with the mail in balance, Stephen. And uh, the, these invoices are all in the US Post. It's, uh, it's, it's truly amazing. In Australia, it's the exact opposite. 85% are sent electronically, like literally out of a zero or out of a, a, a PDF gener generated directly from the invoicing ERP. So we want to change that. In the States, we want to make it like Australia. We want to make it that people will receive their invoice in something faster than two weeks by snail mail. They'll actually get it as an electronic document, as a HTML embedded inside an email. Sounds Sounds pretty simple. Sounds like how it should be, but it's not how it is. And that's what we're changing. Um, so our e-invoicing tool, which we release in quarter one next year, uh, is designed to take data direct from old school SQL databases sitting on the premises of accounting and law firms. These are 1990 style SQL databases and deliver it as a, as a rich HTML with a, literally a click here to pay or click here to take a payment plan. And that will absolutely transform the user experience for their clients and save like absolute enormous amounts of time that could be better spent at giving, uh, giving the clients of these firms the advice they need rather than chasing them up for payment. Uh, yeah, it sounds like the big four accounting firms are keeping US Post in, in business. Um, just quickly on the, on the e-invoicing thing, um, yep. Is that a software as a service model? You just uh, you just sell it to them on a, a, as a package like that, or, or 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 how does it work? Yeah, we've done a since we last spoke, Mark, we've done a lot of research with some firms. Had some really good focus sessions with uh, uh, primarily CPA firms. Been really helped, generous with their time, and really helped us out. Um, the model basically where you conclude is to virtually give the software away. And then because it's going to drive so much more transaction revenue where we clip a percentage, a small percentage of the, uh, the invoice value below 1% of the invoice value and generate more payment plans, literally give the software away and enjoy the revenue stream, the greater exposure of payment plans and uh, pay by ACH does as more clients see a much more easier and more convenient way. And I mean, one thing, um, one thing we have learned from this pandemic, at the start of the pandemic, um, our business literally doubled in six weeks. Like nobody wants to go to the post office. Nobody wants to go to the bank with a check when you can do it all online. And who wants to be receiving checks when the office is closed? You know, uh, old, old Phyllis lives 20 miles out of town. She doesn't want to drive into town just to pick up the checks. So e-payments, absolutely have been one of the things that we know uh, firms and clients love and this tool is just going to make it easier for them again hey hey bruce if you could um convince my lawyers and service providers in australia to switch to snail mail to send my bills in the united states <laughs> i'd really really appreciate that because it's like a, a two-month thing 
So you want us to tr put like a reversal tool in for your lawyers? Yeah, so that, yeah, yeah that's, slow that, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking here. Yep. <laughs> and if, if they're using your service, just cut them off. Just, just cut them off. <laughs> Just for you, David, we'll do that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Oh, I guess. Um, okay, actually, Stephen, I'm going to come back to you now. Um, I'm not sure if this was, was out when we spoke in August uh, on, the, on the timing, but you guys recently uh, published some data at the Global Myopia Symposium. Um, can you give us a, an overview of the significance of that data? Because I know it's quite a like a longitudinal study um, that, that's been going on for a while. Yeah, so um, that study, yeah, I, I think since we've last talked that that came in between uh, the, the importance of that data that we presented at the, just the fact that there was a global myopia symposium, uh, the inaugural global myopia symposium, just the fact that there is one of those should tell you something about how quickly the interest is rising uh, in this area. That's a meeting that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Uh, but yeah, that data, the importance of it is that it took this data that we've been developing uh, in, through several years now, it expanded the number of practitioners, it expanded the number of patients, and it took the longest wearing patients in a study, these are children wearing our lenses, uh, out to five years. Uh, Any time you increase the number of patients, increase the number of study sites, increase the amount of time, uh, generally the, the, the more rigorous the study, the more rigorous the data is, uh, the more variability you see in the data. We, we didn't see that variability. We actually, even at five years, continue to see these children having a very good response to these lenses with excellent vision and very little uh, progression. And so uh, the additional number of patients, the additional number of practitioners and the additional amount of time just adds to the body of evidence showing that these lenses are uh, very safe to use in children and a very good option uh, to manage their myopia. And can I just quickly ask Stephen, uh, is the results of that study, is that up on the Visioneering website somewhere if somebody wants to go and look ahead? Or where yes, could I, they find I, it? it is. Um, if if they go to our website, there should be links in the practitioner section uh, to that presentation. Okay, great. Thanks very much, um, Brad. If I I, I want to come back to you again quickly. Um, we we've talked a lot about the I guess the healthcare side of the business. I just want to switch gears a bit to the um, clinical trials business. Um, to basically, you know, just give an overview of where that business is at, you know, what the pipeline looks like for uh, new business. Uh, and I think one of the key things that, uh, you know, I've always looked at in in your results is that kind of deferred revenue number that's, uh, that sits on, sits on the balance sheet. Maybe just talk through where the clinical trials business is, because that, you know, has been the kind of a, a mainstay business for Cogstate for a long time. Yeah, yeah. So the um, uh, it's a really good question. And so just to, I suppose, um, uh, provide everyone a little bit of context in that in that clinical trials business, uh, we um, it's it's a forward contracting um, way a way of selling. So we we enter into a contract with the pharmaceutical company to provide our essentially a scope of work for that individual clinical trial. What that means is that we have um, that the forward indicator of our revenue is the amount of contracts that we execute in any one period. Um, and then the revenue will roll off over the, over the length of the contract. So, you know, as you suggest that, that um, forward revenue book, as we refer to it, is really critical in terms of, you know, giving guidance as to what our future revenue is going to be like. Um, we had a really successful 2020 financial year. So the period ended June, 2020. Um, executed $46 million US of clinical trial sales contracts. Um, in the year to June 20, that only generated about $21 million of the revenue. Um, the expectation is that, rev you know, and the revenue usually um, come through on a lag from uh, from sales booking. So our expectation is through, through the year to June 
2021, we'll see good growth in that revenue, um, you know, up towards that sort of $30 million US um, revenue figure within uh, within that clinical trial segment of our business. So that's looking really strong. Um, we've actually seen, um, again, the, the pandemic um, provide um, some some um, some wind in our sails, if you like, uh, in terms of as we look to bookings for the 2021 um, financial year. The what's happened with the pandemic, of course, is that global clinical trials need to now be thinking about how do I provide remote assessment of these individuals, and just the, the way that our technology works and the setup of it actually really works well within the context of that remote assessment. So whilst we are still seeing patients come through to clinical trial sites, most pharma companies are at least looking to have an option of remote assessment and that works pretty well for us. So, um, you know, so long story short, um, we've got uh, a, a really good um, revenue figure over $40 million worth of future revenue that will roll off of future, uh, you know, in um, future periods. And um, the, the, sales opportunities actually look pretty strong at the moment. And the clinical trials, right? I know they're probably, you know, long ones, short ones, but mm. the, you know, what's kind of the typical length? If you, if you sign something in 2020, does it kind of basically kind of roll off over the next 12 months or kind of how long does a standard, yeah. standard <laughs> contract last? Yeah, and so it basically depends on the um, the phase of the study. So a phase one study, so your first in human safety study, will be about nine months from first invoice to last invoice. Um, a phase two study, which is where most of our work is, um, is and most of our revenue is generated in phase two, um, they can be anywhere from a you know eighteen months to sort of you know. 24, 30 month um, time period. Um, and then the phase three studies tend to be sort of three years and longer. Um, and, and basically the, the value of each contract increases with each phase because the, as the studies get bigger um, and that's sort of just logical. Great, thanks. Uh, and then I think we'll just get the final question into Bruce and then uh, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up here at the end. Bruce, we haven't uh, touched on your last quarterly that was out um, since we spoke in August. Um, can you give us, a, I know you kind of mentioned about the pandemic, you know, saying your business kind of, you know, accelerated rapidly over a six week period. I'm guessing that was back more March, April time, but give us a, a, an update on results to the end of September and, and just maybe mention, um, you know, government stimulus like JobKeeper, how that's kind of affected the, the Australian business uh, kind of mm. negatively which kind of seems counterintuitive to think you know that government stimulus would negatively affect the business in COVID. Yeah it's, a, it's an interesting thing our, our, our US business continued to grow in terms of the payment processing side of that business it's uh, it's now doing over half a billion dollars a year in transactions through the portal the um, the lending business continued to grow in the United States uh, we signed BDO which is a uh, uh, a massive company, BDO, including its uh, its BDO affiliates, is the number five accounting firm in the United States. So that's a fantastic signing. And uh, so the lending side of the business in the States, the transaction side of the business in the States is continuing to grow. In Australia, the Australian government stimulus payments exceed the total amount of money taken from the economy by the pandemic. So essentially, the pandemic took this amount of money, the government stimulus put in more than the amount of money the pandemic took out of the economy. So that actually meant that a lot of SMEs are actually flush with cash. There are SMEs out there that have had their best year ever, uh, thanks to JobKeeper, which is the equivalent to sort of triple P in the United States. Um, uh, Stephen mentioned it with uh, uh, optometrists, with sales and that sort of thing. It's, it's almost what, what you could call the Qantas effect. Your, uh, your trip uh, overseas was cancelled. So the money from that has now been expended. Uh, people like orthodontists are having their best year ever because people are saying, well, money I might have spent on a holiday. Uh, I could have substituted for a medical treatment. Hey, can't take the holiday. So they're taking the, the, the medical treatment or whatever. Money not being spent on bars, whatever, being expended in other ways. Um, you know, Bunnings, which is the equivalent to a... Um, 
Uh, Home Depot in the United States has had like an incredible year. So there is money. There is money around. So that hit our lending business in Australia. The US, still strong. Australia, we took a little bit of a hit in that first quarter. I think it's uh, one of the uh, unintended consequences and it, it, it's kind of hard to ra- wrap your head around it um, that it would be negative for a business because they, you know, they've tried to kind of help every single business, but these like unintended consequences are, um, yeah, you don't see them uh, ahead of time and then suddenly, whoa, that, that, that was pretty strange. I wasn't expecting that. Um, so thank you for that mm-hmm. overview. Um, Bruce, I, I might just go in reverse order just quickly here to, to wrap up. Um, if people want to find out more about Quick Fee, um, you know, where can they get in touch with you or the your investor relations team? Yep. So anybody, uh, if you want to know more, Bruce at quickfee.com, my US number 310-584-1173. Just go to quickfeed.com, have a look at our site. We've got a whole brand new investor site there as well with a heap of materials and presentations and all sorts of stuff. And if, if anybody's in professional services, have a look at quickfeed.com slash installments and have a look at our new product. It might actually be something you even want to use. Okay, great. And then Brad, can uh, I put this the same question to you if they want to get in touch with IRS? Um... Cogstate or, or find out more where, where's the best place to go yeah so again the best place to go is to our website cogstate.com um the, you go to the investor center there um you can there's uh essentially every presentation we've done over the last 18 months um you can you can find uh there in the investor session there's videos there's powerpoint presentations uh you can delve into the specific earnings calls um or if you want to understand more of the basics of the business there's the some sort of cog state fundamentals there as well we can take you through that from an investment point of view and just one other question uh brad um on the science i guess of alzheimer's uh Alzheimer's Society, the US, are, you know, uh, kind of what Biogene are doing, you know, if they want to get into the science of it, where's a good kind of reference point for that? Yeah, so um, uh, there's a couple of different sources there. So you can go again to the Cogstate website if you want to understand the science of our cognitive testing um, and what we do. Uh, there is, there, again, there's sections there that do that. If you want to understand more about um, what's happening uh, with respect to, um, uh, potential Alzheimer's disease therapies and what Biogen is doing. They've actually just launched, Biogen has just launched a new website that's focused around um, memory loss. Um, and you can, you, if you just Google that, you'll be able to, you'll be able to find that um, quite simply. Um, th- there's a lot of work going into uh, those education pieces at the moment. Great. And Stephen, if you want to find out more about visioneering. Sure. Uh, like everybody else, we have a pretty robust website at uh, vtivision.com. Uh, you can also link from there to the investor website or go directly to the investor website, vtivisioninvestors.com. Uh, also, any release that we do on ASX will have my direct contact information as well as those of our IR firm. Uh, if you want to know more about Myopia, uh, our website's a good place to go, as is myopia.org. If you're over 45 or wondering about uh, this patient population that is over 45 and can't see very well up close, uh, just go to your favorite restaurant at night and look for the person using the flashlight on their iPhone to look at a uh, menu, <laughs> and you'll you'll find out that that's a large market that's worth addressing. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Uh, I'll definitely watch out for them. Um whenever we can actually go to a restaurant again that's the, the yeah. that's the thing it's a it's, it's not a lot of uh, study locations these days um and with that i'd like to thank our our three panelists for joining us today and for uh, especially our returning panelists um for giving us an update of, of where things are at yeah like everything this year things are moving apace and changing very quickly i mean we only did it when did we do it? probably the first week of august and now we're you know the first week of november and you know a lot has happened in that one two three month period uh, so i'll hand back to bobby now to closing remarks if he has any no just thank you all for joining us i uh, really do appreciate everyone here taking the time as well as everybody watching taking the time to uh learn a little bit more about technology and operations in the US. 
with companies listed on the ASX. Mark, thank you again for uh, doing a fantastic job. Fantastic, fantastic job moderating this panel. And Stephen, Brad, Bruce, y'all are pros. Really appreciate thank it. You. So, thank you. So appreciate with that, of course. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys.